Okay, I think we'll start just in the interest of time. And uh, so, I, I, I mean, good morning, everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can see the participants that are going to roll in as uh, with time. So that's excellent. So uh, I want to welcome you here today. It's Monday, and we're going to talk about uh, the UN Climate Change Conference, the COP28 that occurred in November. Uh, my name is Ian Gates. I'm a professor in chemical petroleum engineering, also the director of the GRI program, an energy focus program, and also I'm now associate vice president of research and innovation. So that's me. And uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll go through, um, uh, you know, what we saw in uh, COP28. And uh, before I do that, I'll just do a land acknowledgement. So University of Calgary, you know, we're located in the heart of the southern Alberta. We recognize, acknowledge, and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people, uh, peoples of Treaty uh, 7, and which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, comprised of Siksitika, the Pikani, and the Kanai First Nations, to Sutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspa, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. So certainly we want to recognize uh, that we are on their lands and we thank them for this. Um, so let's now go into the panel. And uh, before I do that, I'll just talk quickly about some logistics. So there's going to be a webinar. We're going to have some questions and talking. And I really welcome you to think about questions as you listen to everybody and uh, use the Q&A feature to add your questions. And we'd certainly like to hear from you what you think and uh, you know to find out more about our experience at uh, COP28. And it was quite an experience uh, as you'll hear in the next few minutes. I'll introduce the panel members now. So first we have uh, Dr. Gada Nafi. She's an instructor in the Department of Chemical Petroleum Engineering at the Schulich School of Engineering. Gada, do you wanna introduce yourself for about one minute? Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Um, uh, so, Gara Nafi, I focus on entrepreneurial activities at the Shilluk School of Engineering here. Um, and uh, one of the things that I also do uh, am passionate about is working with students and mentoring. So I work as a coach with the Hunter Hub, uh, supporting with uh, new startups and uh, build and grow. Uh, I also have my startup company, Letus. It's a clean tech company to support the energy transition, and it focuses on battery metals and specifically right now um, on lithium extraction. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I'm looking forward to sharing my perspectives on uh, COP28. Thank you. Thank you, Gada. And next we have Tim Shaw. He's a public affairs specialist at Tourmaline Oil Corporation. Tim, say something about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, and Thanks uh, for, for pulling this event together. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, as a public affairs specialist, I'm involved in sort of the policy and engagement side of um, everything we do at Termline. We're a natural gas producer based out of Calgary. Uh, and I think what uh, brings us to this conversation is Termline has really been at the front of the pack when it comes to uh, working on technology and innovation that reduces methane emissions across our operations. Um, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail later on, but that's also sort of what, what pulled us into to COP last year. Uh, so looking forward to this and um, yeah, thanks. Okay. So next we'll go now to uh, Nan Nicole Covington. She's a sustainability leader at Spartan Controls and many of you will know uh, Nan from her many interactions at the university. So Nan, how about say something about yourself? Say that everybody already knows me. I guess I don't need to say a whole lot, Ian, but uh, I, I'm a UC alumni from 87. Yes, that makes me that old. Uh, but uh, I started my career in engineering um, and I've been with Spartan Controls for 30 years now. So kind of crazy. Uh, but in my 30 years, I've been uh, focused on as a side project initially and now purely focused on making sure um, that our company is focused on clean energy and innovation, working with post-secondaries and industry alike. So I had the pleasure of meeting Tim in Dubai at COP28 and spending some time with Gada. So supporting Gada uh, with the entrepreneurial work that she does at Lidis and um, an initiative that we've been working on uh, with the David Holub Clean Tech Challenge. So lots of fun things. 
Thank Looking you. forward to the conversation. Well, and thank you all. And let's put up a couple of slides. So I'd like to just sort of go over, and this is really for the audience. So Stephanie, if you can put up the slide number seven there. Yeah, I just want to sort of go over a bit of an intro just in a couple very quick minutes about and COP and, uh, you know, the UNFCC, so United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And, you know, it's very hard to capture this in two minutes, other than to say this is the, the directive, uh, you know, from the United Na Nations to, um, you know, deal with climate change, right? So this is about, you know, stabilizing, you can see the objective of the convention, that stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations such that the planet stays safe. So that's often captured in you know, uh, the idea of controlling the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees C or 2 degrees C and so on. Uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of activities that occur. I mean, these are not small events. And, uh, you know, there's an event in Bonn. There's an event that happens outside of Bonn. The Bonn event is happening in the next month. And so that's where you have the secretariat of the um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, 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 COP, uh, the convention, but the thing is, is you also have the main convention where a whole lot of negotiation occurs and decisions are made, all dealing with the idea of climate change. Let's go to the next slide. And I'll just talk quickly about uh, COP28. So this was an event that was held in November of last year, November, December last year. Uh, it was projected to have about 70,000 attendees. It actually had about 85,000 attendees. This is held in Expo City in Dubai. It is like a small city, and it's, it's a massive event where you have two main zones, a blue zone, and so that's a zone where you have delegates, party observers that are in there, and then you have the green zone where this is for the public, and you have a whole lot of, a lot of activities happening in both zones. So it's an amazing place to go and witness what, how decisions are made, discussions, debates, and so on, and all things sustainability, and energy, environment, climate change, indigenous, and so on. You know, when you look at the topics, I've listed some of the topics there. You know, there's global stock take, the climate change itself, greenhouse gases, lost damage fund, fossil fuel, cement, the big industries where we see uh, you know, we need solutions to move forward with respect to decarbonization. Of course, hydrogen, indigenous matters, gender issues, EDIA, and oceans. Uh, the topics are immense. And in fact, when you go there, it is something that is quite uh, remarkable to witness the degree of topics. You can find any, you know, there's everything there that is interesting within the scope of sustainability, climate change and how to find solutions to these things, which they're, none of them are easy. There's no clear paths at this point on this. So let's go now to the next slide. And I just wanna show, this is a map of what happened in Dubai. So there you have the blue zone and you have the green zone. And uh, then let's go to the next slide where I show you a zoom in on the blue zone and the blue zone there, sorry, it's a bit blurry, but the thing is, is in there is, uh, you know, an immense number of pavilions, many countries there over 120 countries, all with their own pavilions. And then you have other groups there, environmental groups, university groups, and industry groups and others there, of course, uh, you know, talking and having sessions on what is important to them. Uh, you know, if you were to look, the Canadian group was down here in near that B5, it was in that area. And the CRIN and other ones were up on the right there where you see the brown green bits, it was just around there. And they built entire tent buildings for these things. So it was quite remarkable to not just witness COP and to experience it and to go to the discussions and listen to amazing people, but also just to see how they built such an event, uh, you know, quite remarkable. And then we'll go to the last slide, I believe it is. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but just say that a whole lot of issues are you know being addressed with solutions that are evolving right and so i would welcome all that are on the call to you know become involved in some way in looking at what these issues are they're all important to all of us uh with respect to climate change 
Okay, so I think that was it for slides. Maybe I had one more and uh, that was it. So Stephanie, if you go forward one more. No, that was it. Perfect. So let's now go to the questions and the discussion with the panel. And again, please, uh, if you have any questions please, or comments, please put them in the Q&A and certainly we will get to those. But I'm just going to go in order of my screen, which is, uh, you know, just in a clockwise and then we'll go back and forth. So let's just start with all the, the panelists. Uh, let's start with you, Tim. You know, why did you attend COP28 and why was it important to do so? Um, yeah, so it was an incredible event. Um, we got, we our involvement was through the, the CRIN Pavilion. Um, so that's really where we focused most of our, our time and attention. Uh, I was there with one other uh, delegate from Termline, uh, our Director of Emissions and Innovation. And uh, we were included in a number of panels and, and discussions on the Emissions Testing Center that we're part of, and, and Ian, you are as well, through the Natural Gas Innovation Fund. Um, and through the, so for those who, who might not be um, familiar with the Emissions Testing Center and the ETC, uh, Termline's role in it is it's a, a live operating uh, gas facility and we give uh, clean tech companies that are focused on measuring or, or mitigating methane emissions opportunities to do live field tests or free charge at, at the facility uh, to validate and, and test test their various technologies. Um, and Ian does sort of similar but different activities in a lab environment through the UFC. It's, it's a quite an interesting program. So we were uh, involved in a number of the panels to, to share that ETC story, but also to talk about sort of the collaboration of the ecosystem here in Canada and how different segments of industry and, and nonprofits and academia are all working together towards this objective of developing technologies to reduce emissions and, and specifically around that, that methane story. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was really why why we were there, and then why was it important to attend? Um, I think you, know, you, you kind of hit it on the head with the, the size of this thing and, and how much, uh, how many people are coming together to work towards solutions. So it really is important to, to be there, be part of the conversations and uh, make sure that uh, everybody is, is working towards the same place. So that's why uh, we thought it was gonna be important to, to be at COP28. Excellent. Let's go to Nan. So Nan, you're, you're, why did you attend and what was important? So um, I wear several hats. So the hats I wear, first and foremost, the one that pays me is Spartan Controls. But I also serve on the board of PTAT, which is the Petroleum Technology Alliance of Canada. So um, uh, I'm on their board and work closely with Tourmaline and, and the work we're doing in the methane reduction side. And then uh, the other hat I wear is I serve as the theme lead for digital oil and gas, co-lead that with Heather Herring, as well as serve on the steering committee. So uh, my purpose there was to support the CRIN team as a volunteer um, and be part of the story, uh, Canada's story of sharing what we've been able to achieve. Because I think as, as Canada, we've, we need to tell more about what we've done um, as an industry and as a country and as a province. And so um, that's why I attended. To be honest, I was I had a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome as soon as I hit the ground because I didn't realize, you know, when you look at it on the map, as you saw the map, you don't really realize how big um, an event it is and how big of a uh, an entity and opportunity it is till you, till you walk. You know, when you're able to clock 25,000 steps a day, just trying to get from place to place um, is it, really key. Um, and so that's why I attended. And it was important for me, well, I think I already mentioned it, important for me to share our story. And, uh, you know, as, as Spartan, our key story is that we've been able to abate 24 megatons to date um, with the solutions that we've provided. So telling the world that there's great solutions out of Canada. Oh, thank you, Nan. Gada, why did you attend and why was it important? Oh, thanks, Ian. Um, well, I've always been passionate about the environment and about helping the world create energy sustainable solutions um, for, for, for our future, really. And every day I always thought about how we can make the biggest impacts. So for decades, I've watched the world leaders meet 
Um, I've heard about COP. I've seen policies being developed. Um, and I knew it was the place uh, where big decisions were made. I was excited to um, represent Canada on this world stage. I wanted to talk about all the work that we're, we're doing uh, here at the university, um, in the province and in the country in general. Uh, we do have a strong clean tech sector that's being developed. And I wanted to talk about Litus, the company that uh, we've created and what we're doing to make lithium um, uh, as a battery metal more efficient, uh, economical and more abundant. Um, and I, I found that people were not even aware of the strategic work that's being done in Canada at this time and right here. And uh, they were not even aware that lithium can come from water as a potential source and everyone thought hard rock uh, form right away. So it was exciting to be able to uh, update and almost educate the world on the important work that we're all doing uh, here that we're developing uh, coming out of universities and work that uh, started as research supported by many different groups and actually being impactful, developing and growing uh, to make an impact for Canada and the world. Excellent. So we're going to now let's go to a second question. And, you know, I want to ask you about your key learnings or experiences at COP, you know, and I, and I guess, you know, 25,000 steps per day, so many kilometers, there may have been a health benefit there. This is awesome. And I'd like to hear about your other learnings and experiences. So what we'll do is we'll start with Gata and we'll go back the other way. So Gata, tell us about that. Um. Well, one thing that I realized very quickly is that Canada is really making headway, uh, especially in their investment in developing technologies and R&D. Uh, we may be the, the top country in the world uh, that is putting resources in R&D, and we're certainly leading the way uh, for a lot. We have a lot of excellent ideas. We have a lot of talent and expertise, and we need to take these ideas and scale them to make our technologies and solutions available for the world to use. So um, we would look at that next phase of how to build these connections, um, how to uh, reach those places to be on the map, not only in technology development, but in also implementation and building something on the field. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, and I learned very quickly there is um, sources of emissions and a lot of talk around heavy industry being the biggest source of emissions. Um, and it's something that we we would want to uh, focus on improving on. And, and I'm not talking about a country. I'm talking about the world in general. Um, I was very uh, pleased and, uh, and very proud of all of the initiatives that I saw Canada involved in that I may have not learned about it or known uh, sitting here, uh, but really as a country, we're helping a lot of developing um, developing countries and the developing world, supporting them to uh, reach initiatives in the clean tech sta uh, stage in being sustainable, in improving a lot of the processes that happen. And uh, that was something really exciting for me to see and, and know that we as a country are part of these uh, um, excellent initiatives. Excellent. Nan, key learnings or experiences? Well, you know, having been part of the CRIN team, um, again, it was as CRIN touts, it's a network of networks. So it was a great opportunity to meet up with all sorts of different people. There were over 400 folks that came to the CRIN booth, um, 77 different groups and 32 panels. So you get to meet a lot of different folks just going through and supporting that work, as well as exploring the whole grounds. And so, you know, for me, my key learning was being able to connect and understand what other folks are doing across our own country, let alone around the world. Um, and then it just provided me an opportunity to understand different perspectives. So I got to see some new tech that was being developed or currently in development um, to, you know, understanding how the education process actually happens in the UAE and their efforts around clean energy. And then some new technologies in the green zone that is more of the, the commercial side rather than the, the, the policy side. And uh, it's just amazing the work that's being done around the world. It just opened my eyes. Thank you. Uh, Tim, key learnings or experiences? Uh, so much like you said in your introductory comments there, Ian, one of the biggest learnings was immediate. And it's as soon as I walk onto the grounds, just how big it was, um, how many people are there working on these, on solving these problems. Um, the, the 
and, and how diverse the groups were. Like the first person I met when I was on grounds was from Google. So you know, it, it's it's people of all types from all industries that are there working on, on uh, different types of solutions. Um, one of the other big takeaways I had that really seemed to resonate uh, you know, at different points throughout the, the week that I was there is that uh, Canada is at the front for a lot of these initiatives. And you know, you had in your your overview of COP all the different initiatives and kind of areas that they, they're working on. Um, there's a handful of those where, where Canada really is at the forefront around collaboration, around technology development and investment in R&D. Uh, as Gato was saying, um, building the networks to advance these things, much like uh, you know this group is involved in and where CRIN really helps facilitate. Uh, that we're we're really uh, leaders when it comes to reducing emissions amongst heavy industry and and developing those new technologies like CCS and, and hydrogen. Um, so I took a lot of pride actually away from what Canada is doing and what industry is doing around it, these and and our contribution to uh, working towards these solutions. Um, I mean, it, was, it was quite amazing to hear the different stories and, and some of the different technologies that were showcased. And and I only had a little bit of a sliver the because of the, the size and scale of of the grounds um, and how my schedule was sort of put together with different uh, activities in the Crin Pavilion. I didn't get a chance to really spend a lot of time in the green zone or, or take in too many of the other other conversations. Um, but those that I did take in, it was it was really clear that you know there are there are countries and organizations that are still very much in the exploratory phase of many of the things that we are are actioning today. So we should be really proud of what we're doing in Alberta and Canada. Yeah, you know. Uh, well, is, you know, and it's, you know, and one my observation is, is that the challenges we face are the challenges everybody is facing. You know, I think this is a very common, you know, unifying uh, challenge, climate change, decarbonization, efficiency, food, water, uh, all of this life, it's all so unifying. So, no, I agree with everything we heard. You know, in a way, one central theme that seems to come up is collaboration, you know, and it, you know, these, these challenges are so vast that it makes it very difficult to imagine any one person or small group can do it, that you need massive collaborative efforts to tackle these things. So, you know, how does an event like COP28 reinforce that with within what you're already doing with respect to collaboration between, you know, different stakeholders like industry, academia, and, and communities and beyond government and so on? Uh, let's start with Nan, and then we'll go Gata and then Tim. So Nan, what do you think about that? Um, this conversation is just an, uh, already a collaboration, right? And so uh, there's things that happen after or post COP that I see now that I've had the opportunity. So um, when you're in a setting like that, it goes beyond the professional setting. Does that make sense? You know, you're there under your your um, or wearing your corporate hat, but you get to have a conversation with people to understand deeper around what. Um, motivates them to do the things that they do. And so to me, uh, um, it's the post uh, COP 28 that's allowed me to be more collaborative. Um, but, but you know, having, being open to conversations, and like I said, with over 400 people coming in and out of the CRIN booth over the two weeks, um, it allowed for deeper conversations. Uh, excellent. So, Agata, what do you think about collaboration and, you know, how did COP28 in a way enhance or reinforce uh, the need for greater collaboration? Um, I, I would say that um, COP is an event and, and Ian, you just showed us a map of how massive it is. But one thing that's worth also uh, thinking about is all of the other events that happen uh, just right outside COP and along throughout the event. Um, two of the big ones that I can think of and I, I enjoyed personally, one is uh, investment COP and the other one is innovation uh, zone that had a lot of the new technologies that is uh, being developed in one place, uh, just, you know, uh, really groundbreaking um, technologies. And 
Um, it's an opportunity not, not to only be in the event, but to expand and take advantage of everything else that's happening in the city alongside COP. Um, this is a, and, and COP itself, of course, is a great opportunity for, uh, to bring all the leaders together in one place. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to share the ideas, to share their perspectives, um, and to build long-lasting relationships. It's the kind of event that when you attend, you always remember the people you met at COP. You connect with them, and and it's a journey, and it's uh, sometimes hard. You want to get from a place to the other. Who is it that walked with you? Who is it that you had a conversation? And sometimes these um, fast conversations can turn into very solid and amazing relationships, because that's when you find grounding connections and alignment with people all of which are trying to commit to one thing or are aligned on a, on a goal. And uh, and to find that go common goal and to commit to it uh, is actually really interesting. And to see it happening on the policy level and policies that can truly change the world that we live in is very exciting. Um, one thing is uh, really identifying the challenges that comes up with the solutions sometimes doesn't happen very fast or as easy as it may seem. I mean, I remember being as an outsider watching COP and policies coming out of it and thinking that, oh, you know, all these world leaders are going to sit together and they're going to come up with a decision. But I I, uh, I realized when I went that it can take years uh, for these policies to actually be agreed upon, to be reviewed, to be passed and to become actionable, actionable items. Um, and that lengthy process somehow needs to be shortened with more efficiencies so that our world can move in the direction that we want, but we can do that more quickly. Um, so again, all of these communications and connections and collaborations is what's going to help us uh, push our goals forward and hopefully fast. Thank you. Uh, Tim, so uh, with respect to collaboration, what did you get out of uh, COP28? Uh, I mean, yes to everything Anne and, and Gata have said. Uh, I think that one of the, the things that really drives value of an event, the, the size of COP28, which I understand is quite a bit bigger than past uh, COPs, but um, it's the collaboration by collision. So you just happen to bump into people that uh, you wouldn't have otherwise had access to. And that's, a you know, as the others were saying before, a great way to, to just get ideas started to start to share a little bit of information and uh, start to build some of those relationships that are really going to solve uh, meaningful problems. So yeah, that was one of the, the the big ways I observed kind of the collaboration happening around, around COP last year. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's uh, all three of you, these are, uh, this is excellent. I mean, it really reinforces that idea of, you know, that collision space, and that might be one of the greatest things COPs pro, COP events provide, is a place where people come and convene. That power to convene is so important, right? To be able to convene in a place where there is common focus, common interest, yet such diversity of thought and opinion and and methods and solutions, which then, you know, especially when you think of, a, uh, you know, global solutions, the challenges in Canada, cold climate might not be exact. The solutions might not be exactly the same for other places on the planet. So it's what really builds a diversity of not just culture, but all of it, right? Uh, which makes it an amazingly powerful event. You know, I'll, I'll say one thing about my my trip there was I gained so many Watts Up connections, <laughs> you know, where now we share all kinds of things through Watts Up. Right. Whereas before I didn't have all that many, but now I've got a truckload of them and we are continuing these discussions on plastics and, of course, methane and other things and their issues in, you know, all over the planet Indonesia, Australia, you know, South Africa and so on. So, um, you know, I think for the audience, you know, if you want to meet, a, a you know, go to an event where you can truly meet people who are in a way uh, have a common spirit of building and going beyond today, this is an event for you. Uh, Nan, did you want to add something there? Well, I just wanted to echo everything that you've just said there, Ian. Like, um, uh, even though uh, it's 85,000 people, the 700 Canadians that were there, or whoever, however many hundred, we all found ourselves at the Crin booth, right? And so even though you got to meet everybody globally, we were still united as a country. Um, uh, and so I thought that was one of the coolest things ever was that we all have this common 
um, like-minded thought about trying to improve our society. Yeah. And I just want to build very quickly on what both of you said, but I can't remember how many times I actually made the comment that we needed to travel all the way across the world. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> how close we are. And it's really interesting. <laughs> have very busy lives and being put in that setting where you actually have time to connect with people and talk exactly. and ideas um, is really uh, very, very exciting. <laughs> and, uh, I have to say refreshing as well. So yeah. 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 that's too funny. You're right. God, I, it took us all the way halfway around the world to actually spend some time together. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> that's we... the secret. It's, uh, it's focused time of, doing nothing but days on you know thinking and discussing and challenging each other on these things right that mm -hmm. is critical mm -hmm. to work collaboration the uh the time difference made it that the work days were flipped too so you, you weren't even distracted by emails you could just focus only on all the cop activities yes that's, right. <laughs> that's so true tim and true. So i had to uh sorry go ahead gotta i i was just gonna say it also meant long nights working sometimes <laughs> Exactly right. That's right. And you were going to say something. No, it was so every evening I would put down all my notes and just fire them off because that's what was requested of me was just fire off notes on a daily basis to, to our team here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the notes sometimes would be, I'd send them in the morning instead of the evening, but morning here is 930 or morning there was 9.30 in the evening here. And so I had a few uh, people raise eyebrows going, why are you getting a text from Nan at 9.30 in the evening? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So let's, let's go to now, uh, you know, you know, when you think of some of the, the technology and solutions that you saw in COP28, you know, and this, this is a world changing rapidly, with focus on decarbonization and emissions reduction and so on, you know, was there any something that stood out within the event for you? So let's go. Uh, we'll start with Gada, then Tim, and then Nan on this one. Yeah, I, 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 th I feel like I'm going to answer that question in in uh, in two ways. One is a very um, global way, and the other one is personally. Um, so the first. Well, certainly you'll talk about the COP28 climate deal. Um, and of course, the goal of that was to triple renewable energy uh, production by 2030 and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030. Uh, it is something that was negotiated. The UAE, uh, ne UAE negotiated that deal and 118 countries um, actually supported it. And among them was the US, China and EU. Uh, everyone came on board and... Uh, Oh, of course, the goal was to limit the global warming by below two degrees, which is an exciting goal. And I would say that's a big global takeaway out of the event or or uh, something that we certainly uh, saw as a, as a particular um, highlight. Personally, I was amazed at the digitalization in AI that I saw. It was just the hot new topic. Everyone was talking about how this is implementing in, in implemented in every way in clean tech uh, to advance uh, clean energy technologies, uh, how it's integrating with, with a lot of different technologies. And, and it was also really interesting for me to see how some countries around the world are extremely advanced with a lot of headway in these areas. Um, you know, uh, we, I, I would say that we as a country, um, I, I thought we're like, Top tier, and yes, we have the best AI, and we're we, you know, or one of the best and developing, and and it's amazing to also see other countries coming on board and developing and advancing in this field. Uh, I wasn't aware of all the things that were happening, and I know I remember going to that innovation zone and seeing all of the new things that can be done with AI and 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 advancing. And I was really uh, excited to to be aware of who's out there, uh, who's leading the way, and who's catching up, and how things are working and the dynamic in that space. So um, that was a bit of a highlight for me. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Tim. So what we what was if, if there was one thing or a couple of things you saw that really kind of stirred you with respect to technology or solutions, what were they? Uh, so the, the first thing isn't really a technology or solution, it's more of a challenge, but it's that um, sitting in different sessions where different, uh, I, I really enjoyed, there were a couple of different pavilions that had um, representatives from different countries addressing the same, like speaking to the, the same questions, the same challenges and whatnot. And it became very clear in those sessions that there are, there's a big difference in the, 
the types of problems that different countries face and the the paths to solution are very different and their priorities are very different, um, which I think also speaks to how challenging this is going to be because the problem that we're trying to solve isn't the exact same as um, the problem that a, a smaller nation in Asia is trying to solve. So, it, you know, being able to just get on the same level and, and agree that um, what are the different pieces of the puzzle that are going to make up the solution, that that is challenging um, in, in dealing with this sort of the, the global size and scale of, of the, the challenges that we're facing. Um, and then the other thing that, that really jumped out at me um, was in the outcomes of, of COP. And, you know, there's been lots of talk about the commitment to start to um, uh, throttle down use of fossil fuels. I can't remember the exact language of it. Oh. But, but the next point that they, uh, in, in that same document, was recognition that some fuels are going to have a bigger role in, in the future than, than others. Um, and that really made me think through again what our opportunity is here in Canada to to support uh, different countries as they work through the challenges of uh, reducing emissions and maintaining energy security and building economies and doing all those things to get to where we are in Canada to our level of, of, of privilege um, the the opportunity that we have to contribute to that so you know what's the role of natural gas and how can we get more of it to these places that are that are going to need it because uh, i think that is the fuel that was being um spoken to in in that bullet of the outcome so i think that um at the opportunity for us as canada is to really uh grasp onto that let's figure out how we can can really help advance um these the the efforts of these other countries um by supporting them with our resources Thank you, Tim. Uh, let's go to Nan. So Nan, was there one nugget, one technology solution that really stood out for you or surprised you? Oh, you're still on mute. Okay. This I thought was just an odd thing to have on the grounds in the green zone was the souped up Mustangs that were converted to uh <laughs> to electrified, right? And so selling them for $450,000 US, that was just like, what has that got to do with what's happening here at COP, right? And so I just thought it was just a total opposite of the intent of what COP is supposed to be. So that that was a bit of a shocker for me to have that showcase and they were trying to sell them. And, and maybe it's appropriate and UAE, but, you know, for the rest of the world, it, it's not... I didn't think it was appropriate. So just exactly what Tim was saying is things that we see here is maybe not be, um, or what our solutions here may not fit in other parts of the world. But the other piece I wanted to uh, learning for me was that we're going to double our global energy efficiency by 2030. Okay. So there's fuel switching, there's all these things, but um, it's going to take us some time to actually do that fuel switch. And so what do we need to do now in order to achieve that, that global uh, energy efficiency? And I think by next COP, you actually have to start reporting the things against the things that you've actually stated that you're going to accomplish. So that to me is, what are they doing? Because uh, that piece needs to be accelerated in a big way. Um, as uh, our work here at Spartan is around energy efficiency, or a good portion of what we do is around energy efficiency, um, there needs to be a lot more um, uh, incentives and investments in that space in order to make that happen. Yeah. Right. Um, that's one, oh, sorry. And then something else that I noted is that, you know, Canadians were sought out a lot, um, especially with respect to our leadership with carbon capture and methane emissions. So kudos to Beth Hardy Vallejo over at the International uh, Carbon Capture Knowledge Center, um, just her work in the policy side, you know, she was sought out quite often. And then uh, the methane side, obviously, uh, Sohil Ashkapur over at PTAC has spent a lot of his energy in that space, uh, no pun intended there, sorry. But, um, you know, it's it's cool to see that Canadians are sought out for our expertise. Yeah. No, I, 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 no, thank you all. And, uh, you know, and I observed that too. And I saw, you know, some of the interesting things in the innovation areas were, you know, you know, solutions that are span, you know, energy, water, food, and community, 
right? It's not just about one that these things are all connected, you know, and we see certainly that within Canada, a global issue of water, you know, which is connected in some ways to energy and to food and to people. So I, I found that fascinating that there is no, there's no boundary really on all of it. It's all one and the same in many ways. We're going to go into, uh, and I'd encourage the audience, so I know you're all still there because I can see there's 28 of you out there. Uh, you know, please put in questions and, uh, you know, into the uh, Q&A box, uh, anything, ask anything. This is your time to find out about things. And uh, we'll go into the last question right now, which is on COP29. And so I'm going to go first to Tim and then Gata, then Nan, and I would like to ask about COP29 in Baku, Azerbaijan, which is coming up later this year. I want to ask, uh, are you going? Are you looking forward to it? What are you thinking about this uh, COP29? Um, <clears throat> so don't I haven't decided 100% uh, if, if we're attending. Uh, if we're still having the discussion. Like We'll be participants, I think, in some way, shape, or form, but just still figuring that out right now. Um, but I think that the having a Canadian and Alberta and uh, you know, presence from industry, I think is a valuable contribution to the discussions that happen there. And like, all the credit to CRIN for really facilitating that. I hope that, I know that there's some discussions about the role that they play in, in COP29. So I, I, you know, I hope that, that they do do something um, because I, they did a great job of pulling together just you know, kind of every facet of, uh, of the ecosystem in, from Canada. Um, one of the things I would really like to see going forward in COP uh, with is hopefully an increased Canadian and uh, especially Western Canadian presence. Uh, I would love to see this innovation story get outside of our bubble. And the, the CRIN Pavilion was a fantastic sort of gathering point for Canadians at, at COP. Uh, and they for sure drew in a few um, international uh, folks as well. But what can we do to really take this the stories that were told at the Crin Pavilion and and really you know tell it much more broadly to to an even more global audience and there's a, a lot of value there I think to showcase our innovation our leadership our collaboration how we're building ecosystems and supporting R and D and enabling these investments and whatnot um, to to um, share that with, with different countries and uh, groups that are you know trying to do the same thing. So that's sort of the thing I would be looking forward to most about a COP29 is the opportunity to just amplify this even more to uh, a more international uh, scale. Okay. No, thank you, Tim. Let's go to Gada. So what are you looking forward to at COP29? Well, I'm looking forward to building on all the connections and momentum that I just started at COP28. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to, of course, represent Canada again. Um, and all of the excellent innovation that is coming out of our clean sector uh, here. I, I think we have a very rich ecosystem. Um, and again, I think CRIN has done an, uh, a fantastic job um, holding an excellent pavilion, uh, showcasing all that hard work that we do and giving us an opportunity to connect with that uh, world. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing all of the new advancements that we've done um, with Letus. Uh, I, I see it that last year was about educating the world and how we can extract lithium from water. And next year will be about how we can take it to the next step and actually build a plant and a pilot that extracts lithium uh, and unlocks um, trapped resources. Excellent. Nan, so what do you think about COP29? Well, I think about it and I go, do I want to go? Um, I think it's important to be represented or Canada to be represented, just like as Tim said. I think, you know, this last COP was one of the first ones where the energy companies are actually welcome to attend. And I think and hope that that continues where they're welcomed. Um, if anybody wants insights on uh, what was said during COP28 or shared at COP28, Crin actually has a pavilion at the Global Energy Show in mid-June. And so uh, there's the decarbonization theater and there'll be more stories shared there that was shared at COP28. One, um, uh, two, I think um, we, we need more Canada. And uh, I was recently in Houston for Sarah Week 
And I counted the number of Canadian entities, startups, or small to medium enterprises that were down there that were being showcased. And uh, it was over a dozen. And so I was, uh, it made me very hopeful that that we actually are making an indent on an impact on society. Oh, that's excellent. No, I, I think, you know, this is the thing. It's it's that momentum, right? So we had, uh, you know, Gadi, you said, you know, that c to continue what happened in COP28. So I, I we've had a, a question from the audience. Uh, so Joe has asked about momentum. How do we keep it going? Uh, so any of the three of you want to comment on how do we keep this momentum of, you know, not just, you know, the focus on COP but also this focus on collaboration that, you know, and this, the communication of Canada to the world and to each other, you know, all of these things, how do we continue that momentum here while we're here waiting for an event like COP29? Of course, we can attend COP29 and do more of it, but how do we continue that momentum going forward? I can start, I guess, um, you know, we very well now understand the impact of emissions on our world and the value of emission reduction. We we have a role to play. I mean, we're part of this of the solution for this challenge that the world is facing. And coming back and focusing on actually building, growing, and having more impact and being very eager so that next time when you go, your story is even that much bigger. You've gone in one year and you've advanced that much. You have something to offer the world that is bigger and to show the impact it can actually uh, make on our world. I um, I know that I met a lot of people and a lot of groups there and I connect with them and continue, uh, you know, touching base, uh, even if it's not all the time, but uh, keeping the conversation going, uh, connecting with the people, uh, building on the momentum, uh, showing how uh, we can do more and more and build, uh, show the enthusiasm and excitement to actually build the solutions and be part of them and uh, continue to tell the story. Yep. Oh, thank you, Gada. Nan, Tim, any comments on that? On momentum? Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that if you want to be part of the clean momentum, join CRIN at cleanresourcesinnovation.com. Um, and, and so I like that community a lot because there's like over 4,500 people in that community already that I can reach out to at any point in time and ask a question, right? If someone reaches out to you, you have to answer. That's part of the social contract. So it costs nothing. Um, and I think just being part of that gives me hope that we will achieve what we need to achieve. Um, anyway, th th that, that to me is part of building the, the momentum is being part of the community and working on it together. I, so I agree with that 100%. It, uh, to me, the, the way we keep the momentum going is we got to keep showing up. Like Nan mentioned the, the dozen or so companies that were showcased at Zero Week. We've got to be there. We've got to be present. We've got to be telling our story and talking about all these great things that we that we have going on. Um, so there's a huge challenge involved in this too, because people, uh, you know, the organizations that we're involved in, still have actual work to do to advance these innovations. But you know, we have to also be able to to go and, and talk about them and, and why they're important and share what our learnings with with others from around the world to help them uh, and for sure take their learnings into our work as well. Um, but you know, be able to do the work, but also do the collaboration at a global scale, I think is, is gonna be challenging, but that's how we gotta keep this ball rolling. And, and we need to share each other's stories, right? So I love sharing Gada's story. I love sharing your story, Ian. And I love sharing the story about the ETC. And so to me, part of it is the entire collective working together. And so uh, that's how my brain works. If ever you want to do a mind map of my brain, that's what you'll see is that everything is connected. It is a spider web that I try and keep advancing further forward. No, that's a, and that's exactly what I was going to reinforce is that, you know, collaboration is key and the stories are ever important to communicate what we do. And, you know, and it's not just within each other amongst our internal communities, but it's also without beyond, you know, and the story of Canada with respect to energy is incredible, you know, and so I think it's uh, something that I, I love what I saw in COP with respect to advancing those stories for others to hear. And, uh, and I love these types of events where we can talk about what we're doing. And that sense of passion 
about doing exactly this. It's as important to communicate the story as do the work behind the story, right? So I, I want to bring this to a close. It's 1051. We're now at the end of the time. And I want to thank Gada, Nan, and Tim for your time and energy and what you've done, even attending COP and all the stuff after and all the work in Crin, Gada at the university, Lightus, all of it. I really appreciate it all. I want to thank you for the discussion today. I want to thank the audience also for this, uh, your attendance. I really appreciate your time and willingness to listen and to hear what we have to say. So thank you, everybody all of this and you know one thing i'd say if you want to be involved get involved don't sit idle be there be a perturber of the peace say what you have to say and let's debate and find those solutions to the challenges we face okay thank you everybody and we'll bring it to a close here thanks so much <laughs>